This is not a pill. It's not something you apply. It's not something you take. It's not something that messes with your hormones. It's completely all natural. And as far as I can tell, has absolutely no side effects. Although it does have uh, some risks. That does feel kind of like I'm being burned though. I'm not gonna lie. What is this in Celsius? Ow, ow, I don't like this, ow. It's been bothering me for years now because it feels so obvious. And so, uh, I, like what, three years ago, I finally decided I had to do something about it. I haven't told you about this. What, what if I told you that one of my pandemic projects was to create a male form of birth control? That would be great. And what if I told you that it worked? That's insane. So this is... <laughs> I've been working on something for the last couple of years that I thought I'd turn into a full documentary. Something covering the biology behind sex, the history of birth control to date, and the cultural movements that keep us from making progress. But given recent events, I don't know that I really have the time to make that move. Millions of women across the US could lose their legal right to abortion. This could be the most consequential opinion in decades. From the Supreme Court that would overturn Roe versus Wade. Raises questions about the future of Roe versus Wade and what this means for abortion rights in our country. So this is happening in the US right now. And lately I've been wondering, why the f is there not a birth control pill for men? Johnny Harris just made this video asking why we don't have male birth control yet. And while it's an amazing video and you should definitely go and watch it, I can't believe that he missed this. Like he put it right into his intro. Just to be clear, I literally soaked my nuts in hot water with the intent to render myself temporarily infertile. And it worked. This seems like such an overlooked form of birth control that I kept asking myself through this whole process Am I crazy? Like, how is no one catching this? Are there any clinical studies happening on male birth control? Well, that would be nice. Um, can you trust men? We are getting closer to the day when men will have the option of taking a birth control pill. But will they? Well, what if I told you that of the six million pregnancies annually in the United States, Three million of them are unintended. So I built a chair in which I could soak my nuts in hot water. All right, the glue worked. It's all set up. I got sperm tests both before and after I soaked to make sure that I was fertile oh. and to see what the results were. And as a result, holy shit, I have the numbers to prove that, yeah, this worked. But I'm getting ahead of myself because as with so many of these stories, as much as I'd like to take the credit for the idea and the motivation, both of those things come from different women. If you want your quick refresher on sex education or the history behind birth control or the why behind the lack of options for males, Johnny's video is fantastic. So in hopes of raising awareness and in response to Johnny's soul searching questions, I'd like to offer up one response, one possible solution to the masses. And let me start with a disclaimer. At the time that I'm making this video, what I'm about to tell you isn't well researched. And that's kind of the point I'm not a medical professional, even though I consulted some along the way, don't worry. And I am in no way, <coughs> no way recommending you do this to yourself at home. Gentlemen, don't, don't, do not attempt any of this at home. My goal over the last two years has always been twofold. One, to contribute to a broader conversation and two, to inspire real medical research where there is pitifully little. Like I said, this solution was motivated by the pain of one woman in my life and inspired by the work of another that I never met. Back when I was dating my ex, she had to replace her expired birth control, a hormonal implant in her arm. The lapse in and then resumption of treatment left her body reeling, effectively putting her on a rolling period that didn't stop for months. She was a trooper, she didn't complain, but it had clear effects on her well-being, not to mention our sex life, which was the whole reason for the implant in the first place. It was one of those nights lying in bed next to her as she tried to fall asleep that I felt a combination of helplessness and, um, what was it again? Oh yeah, this is bullshit. How is it that she's going through all of this for us and there's literally nothing I can do to be a part of it? Remove her for a second. Why can't I just take responsibility for my own reproductive health in a meaningful, non-permanent way? Look it up. There are over a dozen options for women's birth control. For men, vasectomy, and condoms, which are way less effective than I realized. And then WebMD also lists pulling out? 
as an option, which is what you get for checking WebMD. Condoms are about 99% effective when they're used every single time and correctly, but they are more likely to be forgotten, broken, oh, it's just this once, we'll just skip it, things like that. So the effectiveness rate in what's called typical use, which is how most people use condoms when they're utilizing them as their birth control, is a lot lower, a little bit less than 90%. So you're always running a little bit more risk unless you're using them exactly as you're supposed to, which is not the norm. In any case, I'm lying there next to my girlfriend and I remember some article I'd read years before about some Norwegian guys who had come up with their own solution for male birth control. I'm not sure if you've ever tried to get pregnant. I certainly have not. But when couples struggle, there are some very specific things that men are encouraged to avoid. Laptops, hot tubs, humping bonfires. Notice the trend? These Norwegian guys had opted to ignore this advice and go the opposite direction entirely. They bathed their balls in hot water in an attempt to render themselves temporarily infertile. A tiny Nordic sauna for the southern regions. And you might be asking yourself, is this even possible? Why wouldn't I have heard about this if it was? I'm right there with you. This is where we need a brief biology review. The question is, why do testicles hang outside the body? Well, the ovaries are deep within the abdomen, for example. The answer is because sperm specifically develop at a temperature two degrees centigrade below body temperature. In other words, they need a cooler environment to form correctly. But what if you don't want them to form correctly? What if you don't want them to form at all? Well, you're in luck because sperm cells are incredibly fragile. That's why we make so many of them. While one solitary egg is deposited in the uterus every month, an average of 180 million sperm are in every single ejaculation. And they still miss their target more often than not. So the squirrel can be our illustration, I guess. Regardless of their outrageous numbers, sperm still take weeks to develop from their earliest stages. The testicles themselves are like factories, taking raw materials from the body fabricating sperm one component at a time and sending them through a long assembly line toward maturity. The entire process takes place in these long tubes, which are so long and convoluted that despite being a relatively small space, it takes the sperm weeks to get through to the other side where they're kept in storage. Conveniently, the storage unit is just outside, right up against the testes and separate from the rest of the ejaculate in waiting. This whole setup is ripe for interference. You can spend your time trying to swat down every individual sperm after it's exited the factory, but there are millions. Alternatively, you could disrupt the whole manufacturing process and force them to start over from scratch. Theoretically, this is what enables you to render yourself temporarily infertile without doing any damage to anything but the sperm. The rest of your cells can handle the heat. Is it uncomfortable? Yeah. Is it unbearable? For the most part, no. I wish I could tell you that it was amazing, but it only feels good about half the time and the rest is a bit itchy. About 20 minutes in, this is uh, uncomfortable. <laughs> Either way, it's a small price to pay. We're getting ahead of ourselves. I couldn't find the story about the Norwegian guys, so I kept digging. I looked up whatever stories about heat bathing and special underwear that hugged the boys close I could find. But it was all fringy, one-off stuff that made me question the whole endeavor. Nothing went anywhere. Every invention died. Warm balls could be the next male birth control. And it's so simple. Scientists were able to temporarily and reversibly reduce fertility merely by injecting mice with iron oxide nanoparticles placing a magnet next to their balls for four hours to attract the particles, then wrapping an electric coil around the testicles and warming the balls up to temperatures between 98 and 113 degrees. Okay, obviously that sounds great, but am I the only one here wondering how the mice feel about this? I even reached out to one woman who had written about her experience with her partner doing it, and she eventually wrote back to warn me to abandon the entire endeavor completely, and not to involve her in any of this, so I will not be referencing her beyond this. One trend formed in the midst of it all, however. A lot of accounts referenced this Swiss doctor in the early 20th century, Dr. Martha Vogli, who was working in a private hospital in India. She saw poverty and overpopulation colliding 
and wanted to come up with a workable contraceptive solution. She tested heat bathing on her male colleagues over a decade and found consistent, strong results. She taught the local population and saw anecdotal evidence that it was working. She may never have existed. This stuff, like I said, is fringe. Was she the figment of some colonial fever dream? Or was she a woman in a man's professional world, tampering with men's most cherished biological functions, who never managed to gain any traction for having succeeded because she did so before women had the right to vote? I don't actually know. Either way, the math made sense. She claimed if you soak for 45 minutes a day over the course of three weeks at 117 degrees Fahrenheit or 116, depending on where you look, you would manage to render yourself temporarily infertile for a minimum of six months. Some of her test subjects went a year and a half before they started generating sperm again. Let's say, let me just say that again, a minimum of six months. You're supposed to, you soak yourself in hot water for a period of a few weeks and supposedly just, you're, you're infertile for forever. Not forever, but six months. And then crucially, they tended to experience a short period of super fertility, so watch out for that. The math made sense in my head and the water felt bearable to the touch. As the pandemic ramped up and Air France canceled my tickets to Tokyo, I embarked on an attempt to soak my nuts in water hot enough to make a decent broth. I live in a tiny apartment in Paris. I don't have ready access to a bathtub. And even if I did, sitting in water that hot would be miserable. The average hot tub runs at about 104 degrees Fahrenheit. And for me, it gets uncomfortable after about mm, 20 minutes. This would need to be 117 degrees Fahrenheit. But clearly, if I was going to do it, I was going to do it at the extreme. For science. Someone save me. I learned a lot about my own anatomy that, in retrospect, should have been obvious. Like how your nuts dangle from the front of your pelvic region. So when you sit down, they don't go all that low, or more or less. Which is good because it keeps you from sitting on them, but makes soaking them through a hole in a chair tricky until you're about 70 years old. So I had to build it in a way that the pot rose a little above the chair to gently scoop them up. I added tubing to insulate my legs, considering the water came out of my tap hot enough to burn, which also seemed like enough to get me started. I figured if I let the water cool a little and then applied steady heat from a coffee warmer that I glued to the bottom of the pot, I should be able to keep it at 10. I also hadn't looked at this footage in a long time and I looked pretty rough, but I was heavier and more burned out at the time and the world was crumbling, so cut me some slack. I went and got a sperm test to start the data collection and see if I was even fertile. This has been well used. <laughs> that was interesting. So at some moment, I'm in the middle, I'm normal or... Yeah, it's good. Yeah, Okay. But I almost feel relieved to find out that I have a good sperm count and high, like, good quality. The quality of the sperm was good. Uh, the percentage of them was like 50% were modal or were moving. So that's good. So all signs are good, which is great because walking into this, you want to have, you know, a high bar to start with. And that just makes the challenge of disrupting that bar that much more significant. So now I've got to actually go home and do this for the next three weeks and then see what happens. We can talk about sperm tests and how I hope I never have to take one again for the rest of my life another time. I, <laughs> we will at some point, I'm sure it'll come up. Oh God, lighting's not good. In case you forgot what these rooms look like, it's um, not the sexiest of experiences. I realized we probably need a quick dive into what sperm count numbers mean just so we have a baseline for what's going on. And the baseline for health is 50 million per milliliter, 50 million sperm per milliliter. And every ejaculation averages somewhere around three milliliters, which is where we get those numbers like 150 to 180 million sperm per ejaculation. Unfortunately, there seems to be a global decline in fertility rates. Even the guys that work at the lab we were going to referenced this. And now normal is trending closer to 15 million, which is borderline infertility. That's where you start being considered infertile. I came in at about 62 million, which makes me very fur. I mean, like, it's not extreme. There are people that are definitely have higher sperm counts than that, but the owner of the lab started calling me Superman from that point on, which was weird. So I'm doing all right. To give you an idea for timelines here, I was doing one or two tests a week to the day before I started soaking. I would soak for three weeks straight, wait one week just to let it all cool down, and then go back in for another test, and then test every month after that. 
At least that was the plan. I had a food thermometer to track the water temperature independently from the little coffee warmer's claims. And it was a good thing that I did because I quickly realized I was wrong. There was too much water involved for the little warmer to keep up. I'm not really sure how to uh, take off my pants and sit in this thing without turning the camera off. I mean, there are ways, we're just gonna turn the camera off. Because <laughs> as much as I'm happy to, you know, not have the sperm anymore, the testicles are still kind of important to me. So I'd like to keep those intact. Are my nuts actually in the water? Yep, oh yeah, boy are they. I spent half of the time refilling the pot with hot water from the tap, which is a disaster. Oh, no, 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 don't get wet. Uncertain where to get the right heating elements that wouldn't literally boil my nuts, I opted to get a sous vide, a device famous for keeping liquids of all kinds at set temperature. Yikes. Oh man, this is gonna, this is gonna be tight. This is gonna be cutting it so close. Please don't tell on me if this doesn't work and I return it. <laughs> it worked. In fact, it worked a little too well. This might actually solve multiple problems at once. See, I'm holding on to, uh, there's a, there are a lot of feelings happening right now. That does feel kind of like I'm being burned though. I'm not gonna lie. What is this in Celsius? Ow, ow, I don't like this. Ow, fuck. Ah, it's gonna be hard to stay in this. Ah, error. Ah, 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 ah. Test run, this is a test run. Turns out convection heat is a different beast than what I was aiming for. Okay, I can't leave the sous vide on with my balls in the water. I can't even really leave them in while it's on. So now I need to squat just high enough to get my balls out of the water without spilling any, use the sous vide to quickly reheat the water, and then turn it off, get back in the water as quickly as possible. This is 116.1 here right now. Also gotta be careful, shut <laughs> uh, got it. Yeah, watch out. When it cools to about 114 at most, I do the whole dance all over again to get it back to hot. This should average out, right? This is the problem with using consumer goods, I guess. Not only being incredibly awkward and inefficient, this method meant I spent a lot of time out of the water, waiting for it to heat. Well, today has been fraught with technical difficulties. Just getting settled in here. It was inconsistent. It didn't matter how good my logs were, the experiment itself was being compromised. Not to mention that 118 degrees Fahrenheit is literally the threshold for a slow contact burn, but We'll get back to that little detail in a minute. Top all of this off with the first lockdowns in France, and I was starting to feel some real pressure to wrap things up. Today's the day, I'm going for my test. I'm feeling really nervous for a number of reasons. One, I don't really wanna get stopped by the cops. It's so quiet out here, it's kind of disconcerting. It's a much smaller room this time, but it's still pretty Spartan. My plan was to get tested every month afterward to track not only the initial results, but how long it took to get back to normal. I managed to get one test in. The results felt lackluster. Donc là vous êtes à 52 millions. Ah ok, donc je l'ai les basé que par... Euh... Ouais, vous avez baissé aussi en numération. Oui, par 10 millions. C'est ça. I'm... I don't really feel like this is a failure. Well, I put a lot of work in. I've been thinking about this, conceptualizing for months, figuring everything out and, uh, you know, and then executing on it. Yeah, I don't know. I feel kind of sad that it didn't work and a little bit frustrated. I don't know, for the future, like I've learned a lot through this whole process and I've uh, got a lot more to learn. I'm not an expert by any means, but it, I really wish that I could do something. I wish I could contribute. And uh, it just kind of feels like there's no way for me to. And I was really hoping that this would pan out. The numbers had shifted, but not enough to act as its own form of birth control. And then the French government declared no more non-essential medical visits. I was stuck at home with no way to see how things evolved. I lost heart. And I don't know what that is. I don't even know. I'm just that silly guy that soaked his balls for nothing. Dispirited, I let it lie for well over a year. But the idea never fully left. I knew I could have done a better job at making a consistent bath. It only made sense that it should work. All I needed was a consistent source of heat that rested at an accurate temperature. That and the willpower to try again, some source of energy readily at hand. And then one day, the thought struck me. Bello, I'm not sure how you're gonna feel about what comes next, but 
I hope you know how much I love you. Honestly, you could sponsor this if you want to. It's probably too late. You could have sponsored this. My fellow coffee kettle is elegant. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's... Ah, uh, it's a shame. It's incredibly accurate with the ability to hold temperature for extended periods of time. What I didn't know was that if it could hold lower temperatures. Again, no boiling points, please. No other kettle I'd looked at before had the ability to go low enough and clicked the temperature setting down, down, and it just kept going right to 117 degrees Fahrenheit. We left it on for an hour. The temperature did not budge. I had to try it again. This time there was no need to build a chair. I realized I could just set it on a low table and sit on my step stool above it. Comfortable? No. But hey, neither are 18 years of diapers, piano recitals, and college savings accounts. I've chosen my path. In my mind, I'm at the point where, especially with that dip, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's something there. Like, I got multiple sperm counts, I was consistent, and then I did this, and whoop. What we really need to do here is define success. Yep. Like, obviously for me, I want to get to a point where I'm considered infertile. I, to me, zero would be great. Right. But right. what we're kind of looking at comparing ourselves to is the, the male pill. But maybe that's the bar that we're aiming for that's success. What you're doing right here is deciding a priori, like before it even starts, what does success mean? Yep. That way you know if you've achieved it or not, as opposed to doing the experiment first and then looking at the data and saying, oh yeah, that kind of looks like success. You're yep. defining that beforehand. I got tests done again to make sure I was still fertile. It's been a year and a half since I've been here. This is nuts. Here goes nothing. The lab was kind enough to let me come in and get the tests done for free. Thank God for the French medical system. And away we went. I sat, I soaked. You remember that whole contact burn thing? How are the boys? They're good, but I had to stop a couple days early. Why? Because I burned myself. <gasps> too hot? Two days ago. A little bit too hot. I, I cranked it up a little bit too hot. Oh my gosh. I feel like it's happening to me. Oh, f me. No, you didn't. Yeah. Are you fool? Oh no, I'm excited to be laughing. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm all right, there's, there's a blister. Just two days shy of completion and I couldn't soak anymore. I had to go in as I was. I waited a week to let things settle a bit and held my breath for the results. Voila, okay, bon. Holy sh**. Wait. <laughs> oh my God. It's like a f***ing, like, it's like a battlefield and nobody made it. Look at that, there's like two of them moving. Oh, we... Oh, my God. Okay, that was worth it. You're currently talking to an infertile man. No. Nope. We didn't even bother with the count. We just looked at motility, and uh, oh, yeah. it's a yeah. it's a wasteland. Like the when you look at when you look at the when you look at the slide, like you just see one little swimmer going through a, a just a pile of corpses. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. My numbers were way down. It had an effect. Was it enough to deem the method comparable to its peers? No. But it meant there was something here. I felt like maybe I'd accomplished something. Maybe I'd proven that there was a way to take some responsibility for my own reproductive health after all. I went back in a month later to see if things were back to normal or perhaps they'd gotten better. This is the, oh, okay. you didn't get to see the test results from, this, yeah. so this is the test result from after. I can show you the video, okay. but just as a point of reference, this is from a week after I finished soaking. Okay. Right? So you, you, and you can, you know what's going on here, right? Right. Little black guys with uh, sperm. Right. Uh, so then, then I went for a follow-up test two days ago. Okay, so that have been, what, three weeks after? Uh, that, it's just over a month after. That's it. Oh, dang. Oh, wow. All right then. There's basically nothing. Yeah. It took them two slides to find three sperm, wow. two of which weren't moving, one of which was, but was stuck on something and couldn't go anywhere. Wow. 
That's impressive. Oh, where are they? There's just like, there's no, none of the black dots. Where, where are they? Where are your sperm? Do you have no sperm? I got no sperm. How do you have no sperm? How do you go from having an obscene amount of sperm <laughs> to having no sperm? Where are the black dots? <laughs> Now, my question is, though, Jay, yeah. as the experimenter and the Neil Armstrong of cooking your balls, um, does it affect taste? What the f***? Why did you ask that? My sperm count started showing up again the following month, but there's definitely something here. Well, I say heating. Heat your balls, dude. It's fine. It's not a pill. It's not like... I vow so late, it's not, even, it's not even playing with the hormones. Yeah. Controlling the body temperature. Yeah. And you can do it in just that one region. And that's where we kind of left things. I did start another trial in the spring, but the way that things were going with work and just life in general and adopting a puppy and whatnot, I did kind of let off the gas and didn't see it all the way through in the end. It's only been through recent events that I've regained that motivation to get this story out there. But just so you know, my sperm count did come back. It really came back. And I'm not kidding about that super fertility thing. I told you earlier that my sperm count was like 62 million. When it came back, it hit about 110 million. So almost doubled my sperm count for a month there. Just watch out. That also leads to a whole bunch of fascinating things that we unfortunately don't have time for in this shorter video. Like, is this a potential cure for infertility? Not to mention all of the negative effects that birth control can have on a lot of people and the stories that go with that. Just the fact that the female reproductive system is so hostile to sperm to begin with. The whole system, the whole process is fascinating. It is the root of all of our lives. There are a million different things to talk about and we just don't have the time or the space. Why is this even necessary? Why does some guy in a tiny apartment in Paris in the 2020s need to experiment on himself like some gentleman scientist of old. When we've known this was possible all along, why are we putting all of the burden for reproductive health on women? Why aren't we doing something to change it all? So what's the point here? I'm going on a sex strike, just kidding. I do want to encourage any men watching this to ask yourself, would you be willing to do something like this for your own partner? Sit and watch Netflix every night for three weeks with your nuts in a bath. Maybe get a little uncomfortable. Maybe skip out on a couple poker nights. If not, why? What would you be willing to do? And if nothing, why do you expect her to do any different? Ladies watching this, I don't even know what to say. Just know that you aren't alone, even if it really, really feels like it right now. And if anyone at Hopkins wants my data, I am happy to hand it over. And I think it's important as well. Would I do it again? Yeah, if I was in a committed relationship, but I also would like more study done on it. I do see that there are risks involved. I've experienced some of those risks and knowing more going into it would probably be a good idea. So I'm saying don't go, don't necessarily do this at home. I could have, I probably could have been a little bit smarter about this. Also one final legal disclaimer, don't try this at home, but if you're going to, I have a lot of videos you can watch while you soak, so be sure to subscribe and maybe share it with that one guy you're convinced will not in his entire life ever soak his nuts. There's a good chance that YouTube suppresses this video too, but that's why God invented the share button. And if this is all a bit much, world events and personal responsibility in the midst of an ever-changing landscape, this video was generously sponsored by BetterHelp, an app designed to make therapy readily accessible no matter where you are or what's your budget. I'm a huge fan of therapy. If you've watched my vlog before this nugget dropped, and it's been a really helpful element in my own journey coming to grips with my past and the world in which I live. BetterHelp makes therapy simple by connecting you to one of thousands of licensed professionals, whether through text, voice, or video calls. Scheduling time with your therapist is quick and easy, and if you're unsatisfied with them for whatever reason, BetterHelp removes the risk by enabling you to change therapists as often as you need with no questions asked. It can be daunting to find someone with whom you click, who you feel you can trust, and BetterHelp expressly wants to empower you to find exactly that person as quickly and easily as possible. Sign up at betterhelp.com slash jswanson today to give it a try, and you'll get a 10% discount even. You deserve to be healthy and happy, and talking to a licensed therapist is an excellent tool in that very journey. So thanks to BetterHelp for taking the risk and sponsoring this video. And thanks as always to my patrons for enabling me to set out and take my own risks along the way. 
And for those that are still concerned about the boys, they are fine. The burn was really, really small. And now the whole world knows far too much about what's going on down there. But hey, somebody had to do it. So here we are. <laughs>